Dan Bush. This is Sarah Glynn for Media News, and I'm talking today with Hazel, who is one of two women who came from Scotland to observe the elections at the invitation of the Dem Party, um, and is just now in the airport on her way back to the UK. So, Hazel, obviously a lot has happened since the actual election itself, but you were there to observe the election, so I think we should we should start with that. And I wondered, for the benefit of people who've not been to a Turkish election, if you could just describe, well, describe where you went, where you were, but also what what the polling station is like, who's allowed in, what sort of privacy you get for voting, what sort of security there is to protect the ballots themselves, and whether there's pressure on, on the voters from people outside. Yeah, so I've also been to the general election last year, which was a little bit different to this year's municipal elections. And um, I think it's also a little bit regional. So all over Kurdistan region, also Turkey, it's generally in schools that people go to vote. And there are certain laws um, pertaining to the schools. So, for example police shouldn't have um, weapons with them if they're actually inside the um, polling booth, like the room that people are voting in. And last year, there was a proper booth inside the polling stations that did afford people a bit more privacy. But I didn't personally see that at this one, but we were in quite a remote village um, in Shernak province. And it was called Beta Shabab in Turkish or Ilke in Kurdish. And um, yeah, there wasn't actually really any privacy to be honest uh, in the rooms but um, people will make their vote and there's a sort of desk that people from each uh, party so you know Dem Party, AK Party, CHP um, they all also sit uh, in the room as well and they're kind of responsible for overseeing the process so there's a bit of like a collective um, like management of the day and there's quite a lot of people from each uh, political party there as well and also outside the schools um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll probably get into this more later um, it does depend on the region so what we saw in in Ilke or Beta Shabab is um, there's the gendarme in outside the schools which is like militarized police and there's also plain clothes police um, and also uniformed uh but there's you know the the militarized and armored vehicles outside um yeah so did you get a sense that there was pressure on voters that so this is this is what we asked people actually who were there and um, they did tell us that they did feel quite a bit of pressure and i think that also one thing to keep in mind is that actually there's like a normalization of the militarization of the region because you know there's checkpoints there's military checkpoints when you move inside or outside of the cities in Kurdistan region um you can see the gendarme or the uh, military there's military bases all over the place inside cities etc so I think that there is like a desensitization actually as well but it, it of course it does also create the psychological pressure and for example there was you know big families from AK party um outside in the school grounds that we saw ourselves and um, it was like an extended family and people were also telling us, you know, this is also a type of psychological pressure, actually. Um, they also felt intimidated. Um, and it was also reported that um, not not where we were, but at another location that some of the police did have weapons with them inside the schools as well. Um, yeah. And anyway, they're allowed weapons just outside the schools. Yes, they're allowed weapons outside of the schools, <laughs> um, including the militarized, you know, the military vehicles themselves, which were literally parked right outside the gates, literally right opposite the entrance to the schools. Um, multiple ones, actually. Uh, and also one thing that we saw, too, is a uh, military helicopter actually landing directly next to the school, uh, which we were told was bringing soldiers in from Shernak, like central, the actual city. And then you know, we were in quite a remote um, area up the mountains and um, we actually went to the first school and then we went to two others and when, then we were said, we were told, oh, go back to the first school because 
actually now a lot of soldiers have just come and you know in in the region it is it's occupied militarily so there are soldiers around but people know who are the local soldiers you know there's not there's not thousands and thousands of soldiers um in each place usually and um when we went back to the first school there was this long line actually of of soldiers in plain clothes who were waiting to vote and it was a very very tense atmosphere um and we basically were quite you know abruptly asked to leave uh they wouldn't actually let us be present inside the uh polling station at, on that occasion um and yeah we saw the helicopter because it wasn't there when we first arrived and then when we went to the schools and then it had arrived and then it um it left when we were there and is were people able to see the voters lists there were all these soldiers names on the voters lists so um one of our friends who was with us who one of our colleagues who was with us who was also doing the observations she has a press guard because she's a journalist she was allowed to look but we were not allowed and we were barred from looking at the lists um but there is many many areas that people have had more access to the lists and Shernak is one of them Shernak Central that has shown uh hundreds and hundreds of male names who and no women at some addresses at all but just hundreds and hundreds of um, male names which aren't normal military bases and what we were told is that this is basically soldiers coming from outside who have been sent here by the state and they are using other people's addresses to be able because you know it's municipal so you have to have like a specific local registered uh, address to be able to vote in that district and um, yeah there's been like a lot of this um, military people coming and then voting. Over 6,000 in Shernak, I think. I know at the general election, there was a lot of concern about guarding the ballot boxes. And then there were also problems about changes made when the votes were transferred onto the final system. Were either of those issues this time around or not? Yeah, so this was definitely a thing last time. There was really clear evidence, for example, of votes getting transferred from um, the Empire to MHP last time. Well, it was the actual Soul Party last year, but to, to MHP. Um, and then they even ended up being transferred back in the appeals process at points. But I haven't heard of that myself this time. Um, but also it's one of those things that, you know, I think it's really hard sometimes to catch the ways that manipulation happens and... Um, there's been really widespread observation actually amongst the uh, independent observers about this practice with the uh, soldiers and this is something that it's it's in specific areas you know it doesn't happen in every single area obviously um, but it's yeah it's very difficult to appeal this process and it didn't really seem like the ballot box uh, issue was something that was really focused on this year but they were already aware of the extra um people like signing up in municipalities this time so that has been the main focus this year. I heard calls for guarding the ballot boxes but I didn't hear of any con actual concerns I think. At the I point. haven't haven't heard of, of any myself. And what immediately afterwards as the results started coming in was the I mean before things started happening in Van and what was the general view of, of the elections from the Dem party because I think you were with people in the party of, after the elections as well. Yeah, so, I mean, I was in two different places, in Shernak at first, and then I went back to Ahmed, and it was really different in both places, because, you know, in Shernak, people were really hurting, actually, because AK Party for the central area uh, was elected again, and people were pretty furious and also worried you know, people are really worried about their future um, and they're very angry because they feel it's a very, very undemocratic process. And straight afterwards, um, on the same day as the elections, there was a attack on the party office by the police and they arrested at least a dozen people, I think two dozen people. Um, so two of the responsibles in M party and then also quite a few youth as well. And when we were leaving the next day, we heard that the um, them party members had been released, but a lot of the young local young people were still being detained. Um, and, you know, this is just like a kind of 
I think that that's very symbolic, actually, because straight away there's repression. And I mean, like you just mentioned, Dan, already, but it's even when there is a secure vote for the M party, it doesn't mean that repression doesn't come. But when people don't have um, control of their own municipality, and that really affects, you know, funding, that affects education, that affects like all of these different things. It affects also, you know, state propaganda, it affects state control, it affects state access to the border, for example, um, going south and east. And like Chernak is a really strategic location for the state's war policies. Um, you know, all of these things are affected in people's everyday lives. And somebody, not a Dem Party member, but just like a, a local person saying to me, you know, this is, he was saying, I'm really worried about my child's future. You know, she's only three years old. But again and again and again, this keeps happening. Like, I don't know what I can do. And then for Dem Party, people were really exhausted, but they were just busy the entire time. They were saying, we're going to appeal this. We're not going to stand for this. You know, they have cheated the system. Um, and there was this feeling of loss. But there wasn't much, you know, I've seen in like Western media, there's been a lot of dialogue around, oh, Jehepe, like CHP, you know, they've, they've done so well, or oh, this is such a win for democracy because AKP have done really badly actually in this election. Um, but people don't talk about Kurdistan region and don't see the, you know, AKP party can't even, they can't even keep hold of their own seats in the West, but still they try and coup them basically from the Kurdish regions for their war policies and like for, for political reasons. Um, but when we went back to Ahmed, so I, I didn't see it myself because we were in Shenak, but I did see a lot of videos that showed that there was a big celebration. People were really happy, but there was this focus on the other regions. You know, it wasn't cut off. Like, I think the first day people were dancing in the streets, big, big celebrations. But by the time we got back, um, people were just really focused on Chernak and then also the other regions where AKP had sent soldiers or um, or just where they'd also just done well, you know, and then also uh, what happened in one after. So yesterday, all day, there was just announcements, protests. The people in Den Party were incredibly busy. I have to say, like, from morning until evening, just full-on organising visiting the um, family of like the martyr, the shaheed, um, organizing announcements where police also uh, repressed people and two people were arrested from that. Um, nothing like what we've seen in the further east regions where people have been really being attacked viciously by the police. And, you know, there's like a bigger, a bigger answer, I think there. Um, but still like people were then focused on that. And I think that that's like the general you know, it's not clear what's going to happen now. Um, I was asking people, I was saying, you know, do you think that the time will come again? Is this going to be the policy of the state this time? Because it happened so much last municipal election. And people's answer was just, we just don't know. You know, we just don't know what's going to happen. It's just very unclear. Um, yeah. Which is frightening in itself, of course, the, the not knowing. So I don't know when you had to leave that area, were you able to see any of the protests about what was happening in Van? In Ahmed, yeah. in, in well, Ahmed, reactions to the removal of the mayor of the elected mayor in Van. Were you able to see any of the reac reactions to that? Or yeah, you... in um, in Ahmed, I went to a couple of the announcements and protests. And the thing is, like, even just an announcement, which is what it actually was, um, or announcement is maybe not quite the right translation, but a kind of um, like a statement against what happened. Like even these things, when they're made publicly, are very, uh, very like criminalized by the police. So you know maybe, it, like in in Western Europe, uh, you could make a statement saying, "Oh, the state did this and it wasn't good," and blah blah. But you know, in in Baku, you're surrounded by like armed police, armored vehicles, um lots of people already have criminal cases or have spent significant time in prison and these are the kind of things that can certainly get people arrested again and sent to prison so there's like quite high stakes even with just standing up and denouncing these things and um there was one protest outside uh one of like the legal centers and that was made by dem party members um and then and like two of the mps so one person was uh Abba Shaheen and then also pinar as well um she yeah they're both like mps in Ahmed region 
And then also directly after that, there was another announcement in a park in Ahmed, and that was by the Democracy Platform, which is particularly uh, like a Labour platform. And um, so that's yeah, there was like people from other parties or or for people. Yeah, I mean, in general, the people who attend it wasn't only Dem Party members who were there. Um, like, not you know, people. It's just people in the community, basically people who agree with the fact that what happened in Van was extremely undemocratic and unfair and it didn't reflect the will of the people and the second event um, I'm not sure I would need to find out exactly which groups it was present actually um, and yeah but there was like a kind of mix of of people from like various groups and also non-affiliated people as well like not everyone was specifically a member of a specific organization who was present there was oh and the Saturday mothers as well the mothers of um of the martyrs and also of the missing people who had disappeared in the 90s. So when uh, everyone was going to this court in the first announcement, the first like denunciation, um, some people tried to enter and they weren't allowed, of course, they weren't allowed to go in. But um, there was this big crowd of people, maybe a couple hundred people and uh, the mothers who, you know, they were walking as a group and they have the white veils on their head. They're very, very distinctive. Um, and they're really, really, really strong embodiments of the principles of the struggle there. And, you know, like what people sacrifice and what people continue to do as well, despite such a such a deep and painful struggle. Um, they tried to get in. And when they first came, everyone started, you know, clapping and applauding and people were like chanting. Um, it was really, really beautiful to see how people reacted to their presence as part of that struggle and um and part of the like wider statement and they were also at the second um denunciation as well which was in the park um they didn't speak at it but there was yeah like i said it was kind of like a mix of people um present and just one second i'm just gonna check something oh there was i had a thing where i wrote down the chants that people were making but i'm just struggling to find it you were looking for the for the chance that that was said at these demonstrations so do give us do give us some examples yeah so well one one chant that people were chanting is um long live the resistance of van so vijiba for dana wane and also resistance is life and also kurdistan will become a grave for fascism and yeah i thought it was just a very like Every time somebody would make a speech, the young people in the crowd would start leading the chants. Um, yeah, that was all. So is there anything else you want to add before I let you go and catch your plane? Um, it's really hard to, I feel like there is something that I want to add, but it's really hard to put into words. And I feel really, like I really wish that I wasn't leaving now um, because the different layers of, society that say and the, one of the other chants the translation in English is we will win by resisting I think that that is just such a present spirit and energy and that is something that is really beautiful and inspiring and yeah I, I'm sure that people really will resist and if it really is the case that the mayor has again been reappointed I think that that really just shows like that chant that we will win by resisting is completely true. Um, and whatever happens now, because I think that the, the democratic process is completely, is not respected in Kurdistan region, especially. And I think that we need to stop invisibilizing the politics there when we talk about Turkey as a whole and the democratic process in Turkey as a whole and, you know, not see JHP like CHP as this kind of, oh, great, everything's answered now, blah, blah, blah. I think that, yeah, the struggle is really alive and we also need to find ways to support it. That's all. Thank you. And bring that spirit of struggle back to Scotland with you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you for having me.